Well, I am back from yeah. Pakistan, and I was actually back last week, and I didn't get to tell you much about it. I'm just going to say this. It was a blessing and scary. Some of the most wonderful people that I've ever met, I met in Pakistan. And it's a country that needs much prayer. But I'm telling you, things are happening there that aren't even happening here. It's amazing. When people are dependent and desperate, that's when they turn to the Lord. Last week I was uh, speaking down in Fort Myers, Florida to an organization called Teen Challenge. And it's a wonderful organization. And I was talking to this one fellow, and he got so excited. After I finished preaching, he said, this is so clear and simple. And I thought, well, I preached about the resurrection and all that goes with it and our true identity in Christ and the finished work of the of the cross. The same things that, that have given so many of my friends so much trouble. This man who had stage three lymphoma, he'd been living on the street and he was a drug addict and he was desperate. In the last 11 months, God has done a miracle in his life. This man said, this is so clear. And so I think that something that we're seeing is people aren't desperate enough. The more desperate people become, the more willing they are to hear the good news, the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and all that it all that it means. Today, I know today's not Easter, but I've told you before. I said it in a message that I was actually spoke on. I was did a little outdoor thing down in Florida last week, and I said every day we should celebrate the resurrection. We don't even know what day Easter really was, just like we don't really know what day Christ was born on. But it doesn't matter. We know he was born, we know he died, we know he was buried, and we know he was raised. Those are facts. So today I'm going to give you some things that happened as a result of the resurrection. In Matthew 27, verse 62 through 66, if you'd like to follow along, I just want to read these verses. Matthew 27, 62 through 66. Now on the next day, which is the one after the preparation, the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, they called him a deceiver, that deceiver said, after three days, I am to rise again. Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day, lest the disciples come and steal him away and say to the people, He is risen from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. Now, you see how they're setting it up right here? They're covering their bases. Verse 65, and Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go make it as secure as you know how. And they went and made the grave secure, and along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. This was a Roman seal. To mess with this seal meant certain death. Well, I want to say there's no way that the disciples of Christ could have overcome a Roman guard. And there was certainly no way with the swoon theory that people have taught that Christ wrapped in linen, kind of woke up in the cool, dark, damp tomb, went up to the stone, pushed it aside, which you could not do, overcame the guards, knocked them all out, and hopped off. It didn't happen that way. When I was in Israel, our guide, who was a brilliant woman, spoke multiple languages. She was supposedly the top guide in all of Israel. That's the reason we had her, because we were with a group of people where they wanted us to bring back a lot more people. She said that it's the Jewish custom. They wait three days, and they go back to the, to the grave and see if they were certainly dead, see if they were really dead. Just make sure, in case they weren't dead, three days later, you know, they can bring them back. Now, that's an interesting thought, because, you see, they still are teaching that Christ was not really dead. Why would they teach that? Because too many people saw him alive. Over 500 people saw that he was risen or that he was alive. So you couldn't deny the fact that they thought he was dead and now he's alive. Folks, he was dead. The resurrection is real. Christ the Lord is risen today. It's one of my favorite songs. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. Don't you love that? Mm -hmm. that's, that's true. Well, if we believe in the <clears throat> evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ as recorded in the New Testament, then we need to look at some things. 
What is the significance of the resurrection? I want to say first of all. The Bible speaks about the resurrection as a fact. The Bible talks about the resurrection of the last Adam affecting all of humanity. There are some things that people say I'm not clear on. I want to be very clear here. The first Adam died and all died in Adam. There was an Adamic race. The last Adam, Jesus, Romans chapter 5, died. And do you know what died along with Christ? Now this will freak people out. The Adamic race died along with Christ. The Bible says in Romans, I'm going to read it again, in Romans 5, verse 18, it says, So then, as through one transgression there resulted in condemnation to all men, even so, through one act of righteousness there resulted justification of life to all men. The Adamic race, as we thought of it, died. Now, does that mean that people don't need to be born again? No, it does not mean that. Does that mean that they don't need to believe and receive what Christ has given them? No, it does not mean that. You must be born again. You must receive. You must believe. But I am telling you, for all of humanity, the cross did its job. There's nothing else to do. If it wasn't for all men, then every time somebody was born again, every time somebody believed, Christ would have to pay again. But it was a one-time thing. For all men. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can see the, the clear demonstration. Of the power of the true God. In Ephesians chapter 19 through. I'm sorry. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 19 through 21. It tells us that the power of our heavenly father. Is what raised Jesus from the dead. Look in Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 19 through 21. Here's what it says. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Because of this resurrection, it talks about where he is seated. If you look over in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, it says that in Christ we are seated there also. I was really tempted to preach on Ephesians chapter 2 again today. I spoke on it this past week down in Florida. But I was so excited. I just think I'll speak on this one a lot. Because in Ephesians chapter 2, it says you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You formerly walked according to the course of this world. That's all you could do because you were dead in your trespasses and sins. It talks about according to the prince of the power of the air or the spirit that is now working in the sons of, of disobedience. Among them, verse 3, <coughs> we too all, formerly, all, it says, all were dead, all were walking according to the lust of our flesh, it says in verse 3, all, all, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. That was your nature. Children, your nature was wrath. But in verse 4, but God. Strong contrast. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, with which he loved us. Look in verse 5. This is a big, big verse. Look at this. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Now who was dead in their transgressions? All, right? It's mentioned all, all, all. Who was dead? Who is he talking to? All that were dead in their transgressions. Well, here's what it says, that while you were dead, he made you alive. Does it say that? Does it say that? He made you alive while you were dead. What part of that's your part? Amen. You don't have any part in that. It was all him. It's always been all him. From eternity past, it was all him. Now, does this mean that all, that all are saved? This seems to really bother folks. Folks, let me tell you, I'm pretty well set with this. God can save who he wants to. 
And if there's some that I don't think deserve it, I'll just be thrilled that they're there anyway because I don't. But I'm telling you this, that all were made alive in him. Now, even though the gift of his life has been given, even though the gift of his righteousness has been given, even though all that was his has been given, you must receive it as your own. You can reject what's been given. People in hell have exactly the same thing that you do given to them. Exactly. You say, why are they in hell then? Because they chose not to receive it. And they would not believe it. The tragedy of hell, everybody in hell is loved by God. You say, well, I don't believe that. I think you need to look at the Bible. When you see that the love of God is much bigger than you ever thought, is God thrilled with folks being in hell? I don't think so at all. I don't think so at all. I think it grieves him. So much so that he put a roadblock in the way called the cross. Romans 1, 4, it says this. Who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the <coughs> spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ is our Lord. The resurrection shows the power of God. If you don't believe in the power of the resurrection, it's still there. It's still for you. Even if you don't believe it's for you, it's still for you. But some people say, no, I don't believe it. I'm going to live like it's not so. And so as a, for whatever reason, they reject all that has been given to them. They reject it as their own. And they live a life separated from God, not from his side, but from their side. When Adam and Eve sinned, I just want to go back to this one quick thing just to make a point. When Adam and Eve sinned, who hid from who? Adam and Eve hid from God. Okay. They tried to make a covering for their nakedness. Now, it was the custom of God, because he loved Adam and Eve so much, his creation, that he breathed his life into. At the, in the cool of the day, after they had sinned and disobeyed and eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they had sinned and they had died to the fact that they were alive in him, if that makes any sense. There was a change in the relationship. And I used to think God was saying, no, I will not have any relation with anybody that's a sinner. But that's not what the Bible's teaching here. In the cool of the day, who hid from who? Adam and Eve hid from God. Who was looking for who? God was looking for Adam and Eve. Who made a covering for who? God made a covering for Adam and Eve's sin. You say, well, their sin's covered. Folks, their sin's eradicated because of the cross. But this is a picture. It's a picture of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Who restored the relationship with who? God restored the relationship with Adam and Eve. Had nothing to do with Adam and Eve. Now, I'm going to say this. Did man's relationship with God change? From his perspective, it did. From his perspective, from man's perspective, it changed. From God's perspective, it never changed. How do I know? Because the Bible says, but while they were yet sinners. But, you know, Romans 5, 8, Christ died for us. When did he die for you? While you were a sinner. When did he make you were alive? According to uh, this verse over in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. While you were dead, you were made alive. It's amazing. It's amazing. Well, salvation is because of the resurrection. Romans 10, 9, it says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. I thought you said that everybody was, everybody was raised. I did say that. I didn't say everybody was saved. There's a difference. You still need to believe. Those who will not receive are not saved, but they're still loved by God and have been given all that is His, but they've rejected it as their own. They've rejected it as their own. I want to read Romans 5, 8 through 11. 
This is a big, big portion of Scripture right here that I used to just kind of read over quickly. But let's look at it. But God demonstrates His own love toward us. I just talked about this verse. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When did He die for us? While we were sinners. Look in verse 9. Much more then, having now been justified. Look at this. Much more, having been justified by His blood. There it is. Justified by His blood. We shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. Now, who's saved from the wrath of God? Folks, this is something that's kind of big. God's wrath was dealt with. I don't understand all of this, but I'm just really wondering. I'm thinking about it. I'm so glad. Justified blood, we will be saved from the wrath of God through Him. Verse 10, for if while we were enemies, look at this, while we were enemies, look at it, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Wait a minute. Does it say that? We were reconciled after we believed. Is that what it says? It doesn't. When, do, when were you reconciled? While you were an enemy. Folks, I didn't put this stuff in here. It's been here the whole time. How did I miss it? How did I miss this? How did I think that it was in any way, in any shape, any time, anything that I did? While, it says, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. In verse 11. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So here it is. Justified by his blood. Perfect. As if you've never sinned. Who's that for? It's for the enemies of God. Does it not say that? Mm -hmm. It's for those who were sinners. So who is that? What's that word we keep using? Three oh, letters? Oh. All. Is that what it says? All right. Justified by the blood. Reconciled by the death. Reconciled. I have figured the books and you are left Wanting nothing. Reconciled by his death. But here's the great news. Saved by his life. You've got the blood. You've got the death. And you've got the burial. Comes in there. And you've got the resurrection. A resurrection unto life. Boy, this is really big, isn't it? That makes Romans 6, 5 true. Look over in Romans 6, 5. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. This is pretty big. The resurrection of Jesus demonstrates to us that all the teachings of Jesus Christ are true. Everything Jesus taught was true, including his great promise in John 6:40. It says, everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I shall raise him up on the last day. That's what he's going to do. He's going to raise us up on the last day. And, but we're not living for the last day when we're raised up, whatever day that is. You see, he's given us his life now. Even though that some will die, some may meet him in the air. We, you know, he could come back before. But it doesn't really matter because we're going to be raised up. We're going to be changed. Our identity is in the one we truly are. Our identity in him as the last Adam is, is exactly what he is. We are sons of God. Now we're not God, but we're sons of God. Every bit as much as he is the son of God, so are we. All that is his is ours. Now who is it for? Those that were sinners. Those that were dead. Tragically, even though he's given all of this to all men, some rejected. Some rejected. The resurrection of Jesus Christ secured our justification. Our justification. In Romans 4, 25, let's look at Romans 4, 25. I know I'm moving around a good bit, but that's okay. It says, he who is delivered over... I'm sorry, he who was delivered over because of our transgression and was raised because of our justification. Now this took place about 2,000 years ago, a little more than that now, but about, or around there, about 2,000 years. But folks, I'm telling you, in eternity past, this has already happened. This took place. It says that he died, he who was delivered over, 
That means he was di he died. In some places it says died for our sins. Some places it says Christ died. Delivered over, died. It's an aorist passive. What that means, it took place at a point in time. It's finished. Finished. That's what the word means. Finished. And it's a passive voice. That means somebody else caused it. Who caused him to die? We used to think it was people. No, it was God. You say, well, God the Father killed the Son. Let me tell you something. God the Father was as much involved in the death as Christ the Son was. If it was your child, you would be. God the Father loved you, but God demonstrates his own love towards you in that while you were a sinner, Christ died for you. God did this. But it was a middle voice. It could be a middle voice. It could be passive or middle. Middle means he died because he wanted to. That's why he died, because he wanted to. Not because he had to, because he wanted to. And I don't understand why that he would want to do that. If somebody wronged me, I probably wouldn't want to die for him. But he did. And he was raised for our justification. That means completed action. It's finished. There's nothing left to do. The justification was finished on the cross. It's also aorist tense. Completed action. That means it's finished. That's what it means. Aorist tense has to be finished. Punctilier took place at a point in time and it's done. And that's the word that's used for justification. That's pretty big. Again, it was passive voice. God caused it. Had nothing to do with you. Had nothing to do with anything any man has ever done. God caused it. I don't mean to get too excited here, but this is a pretty big deal. Don't y'all think this is a pretty big deal? All right. This is huge. We're not only saved, but we're declared totally justified. The act of God declaring men free from <coughs> guilt, and you're acceptable to Him. Free from sin. The guilt that it brought them declared totally acceptable. It's finished. Well, our own resurrection depends completely on the resurrection of Christ. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14, we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep. That's what it says. I've preached that at many funerals. The reason I preach it because I believe it's true. The reason I believe it's true because it is true. You know what? Even if I didn't believe it's true, it's still true. I've heard people say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. I don't say that. I say, God said it, that settles it. Now, here's the thing. I say that, but sometimes I don't really mean that. Because sometimes the Bible says something that I don't believe, and so therefore I want to help God. God, you didn't really mean this. You really meant that men are going to be justified after they believe. That's not what it says. That's not what it says. The justification comes first. What is our faith? Our faith is not in what Jesus will do if we believe. Our faith is in what Christ has done. And there is a big difference. Do you see that? I'm not believing what he might do or what he will do. I'm believing what he has done. He has given you the gift of justification. It's big. It's for him, too. He did it for us because he wanted to. We're believing what he has done already and not in what, <clears throat> excuse me, and not in what he will do. Well, the power of our Christian life in the present time is the power of his resurrection. I read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19 through 21. I'm just going to read Romans 6, 4. Romans 6, 4. What a great verse. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death. That's what baptism is. It's a picture. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. His resurrection is what we have this, is how we have this new life. He was, he was buried and he was raised. Look at this. So that Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. Do you know that you have the same glory of the Father living in you that Jesus did? Exactly the same. It's a pretty big deal. Pretty big deal. Well, the resurrection of Christ demonstrates that Jesus Christ is going to be appointed judge of all. Now, that should cause people some consternation. You say, now, why would that cause anybody trouble? Because we enjoy being judged so much. And when we realize that's not our job, it just brings people a little despair. 
Well, I can tell you something, folks. God's never called you to judge anybody or anything. God the Father will never judge. He turned that job over to Christ the Son. Christ the Son did not come to judge. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. He's coming back again. He's going to judge the next time. But he's going to judge one simple thing. Not what you did. We think he's going to put up a list. You did this, you did this, you did this. That's not it. Because all the sin of all times has been dealt with. There's only going to be one judgment. And it says it in John chapter 3, verse 17 through 19. And this is the one judgment. Did you believe or not? That's all. That's it. You say it's too simple. It's a simple message, but it's not simple. The resurrection. Acts 17, 31, Paul said, he told this to the Athenians. He said, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Christ has the authority to judge because of the resurrection. We will agree with his judgment, but judging will never be our job. John 5, 22. It says, moreover, let, let, me, let me just, I'm going to flip over to John because I'm going to read a little more than what I originally thought. But in John chapter 5, and there's a verse that we all know, and I'm certainly going to read it. But in verse 22, first it says, for not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. In verse 24 it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, He who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. You'll never be judged when you believe him because there's only one judgment. In verse 27 through 29, it says, And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth, those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed evil deeds to the resurrection of judgment. What does that mean, good deeds? Folks, there's only one thing good, one thing. That's Jesus. Good, see, good deeds, since Jesus is the only one who's good, is saying, I believe you. I believe you. The only thing that we can do that has any goodness at all is believe that his goodness is ours. Is to believe that he has given us his life. That's all. Our only good deeds are what Jesus does through us. When the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, Good master, what must I do to be saved? Jesus is saying, Why are you calling me good? Why are you calling me good? What he could say is, don't you know that only God is good? So if you're saying that I'm good, you're saying that I'm God. Only God is good. Well, our good deeds are to believe that his life has been given to me and that he will live his life through me. That's our good deeds. That's it. What is it we're to do that's good? Simple. Believe him. Pure and simple. Believe him. The resurrection of Jesus means that he will raise up everyone who ever lived. Some to eternal life, some to judgment. Some to judgment. Jesus will be the judge of the wicked. Who are the wicked? Those that would not believe. Now, we all had wicked hearts. And he showed us that, that he has taken that on himself and given us a new heart. All who have trusted in their fallen reason and rejected Jesus, rejected the gift that he's given as their own, rejected it, well, they're going to be meeting Christ as judge. And tragically, tragically, as a result of, of wrong thinking, that there was something that they needed to do, the Bible says that they're not going to be saved. There's, there's a real place called hell. And to not receive and believe all that he's given to you is yours, which it truly is, is to say, I don't want you. I don't understand all about hell. Nobody does. There's nobody here that could talk about it who's lived there and then come back. I've heard a story here and a story there, but it's not like spending eternity in hell. So I don't understand it fully. But I can tell you this. To say, I want to be judged on my own merit, not on what you did. Oh, man. How scary. 
Well, to man's fallen nature, this may not seem fair. People don't know what good is. Only God is good, and only by receiving and believing Him are we declaring that He's good, and we are too because of what He did. Well, how do we respond to the resurrection? This is very simple. We believe and receive Him. We receive Him as our Savior, the one who takes away our sins as He forgives. When did that take place? Death, burial, the resurrection. When was that? Well, it was a point in time, but it was also in eternity. We believe Him for our position, seated with Him, Ephesians 2, 6, in Christ. We believe Him for our identity, righteous, holy, set apart, chosen of God, perf perfect in Christ, adopted as sons. We're given His life. <clears throat> Who's that for? All men. Okay. And we believe Him for our forgiveness. We receive all that, that I just mentioned. Now we believe Him for our forgiveness. He said it's finished. We believe Him for our position, seated with Him, same thing. And we believe Him for our identity. All of these things, the one who has given us His life. Our life has been given to us by Him. He's the owner and the ruler of all, including life. Well, Hebrews 2.14, it says this. Since then, the children share in flesh and blood. He himself also, he himself likewise, also partook of the same, that through the death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. His death, burial, and resurrection has rendered powerless the devil in anybody's life. Say, so, wait a minute. He still has power over unbelievers. According to this, he doesn't. According to this, he doesn't. I'm telling you, the devil is defeated. Not just defeated for the Christians. You say, he's still all causing all kind of trouble. Well, sure he is. He's trying. But the issue is not what he can do or what he will do. The issue is people don't understand what it is Christ has done. Once you understand what Christ has done, and the true predicament the devil's in, the devil is not only defeated, he is judged. Once you understand, it changes your perspective about the devil. He's not equal to God. He's not close. He's defeated. I'm going to close with this. Watchman Nee wrote this. Now, when you're reading stuff that Watchman Nee wrote, you're reading usually a compilation. He didn't write many books, but a lot of people, or some people, have taken his writings that he did for messages, sermons, devotionals, things like that, and they put them in books. And, and just like with us and Watchman Nee, in the beginning, Watchman Nee probably said things that he didn't believe at the end of his life. And since it was all around, you still read it and you have to wonder, when was this? He used to talk about two natures. I read something that he had written, and it was talking about two natures, old nature and new nature, that were still in man, fighting, warring with each other. And then if you read late Watchman Nee, he would have never said that, and he probably regrets saying it then. And I'll tell you this, he didn't write that and put it in a book. Somebody got a message and put it in a book. That's not what he believed. You have one nature because of the cross. He wrote this, In the death of Jesus Christ, Christ, Satan's power of death met its match once for all. De that death outdies all other deaths. Death in Adam does not finish man, but death in Christ does. The old man died in Christ. He's a new man. It is a mighty death. In Christ, all those who deserve to die have died, with the result that he who had the power of death no longer has dominion over them. They are dead. And ashes are something of which you can never make a fire. Christ's work was not only redemption. It was death's destruction. With all that that means. A house once burned to ashes cannot be burned a second time. For if the first fire has done its work, there is nothing for the next to do. For us redeemed sinners who have already died a death in Christ, death itself is passed away. We have become possessors of an incorruptible life. This is who you are. This is what's been given to the world. My prayer today is that people around the world 
would come to know what Christ has already given them. That's it.